taken to our next uh, session, which is around the idea and concepts of building consensus uh, and support among the public, which we've just heard about, but also among experts. And when we say experts, what we mean is folks who know a lot about energy and environmental issues, many of whom are in the room uh, today and online. And you know, thinking about this in terms of how do we find some socially viable uh, pathways to, to net zero. So we've done a lot of work uh, with Nick, as was mentioned on public opinion. Uh, we've done a lot of work increasingly too on that expert uh, opinion. And you're gonna be hearing about that uh, this afternoon. And we know that energy and climate uh, can be divisive issues for the public and also uh, for those of us uh, who are sort of in that expert community. Um, as Nick just, just uh, presented, Canadians are rarely outright polarized on, on the issues, but they do often hold different views over the future of energy and, uh, and climate. Um, energy and environmental leaders can likewise be divided on the issues, and as Marissa is going to share with us this afternoon, occupying two different uh, realities on energy transition that can talk past one another. But public and expert support for Canada's net zero journey, journey is going to be critical. This is one of the reasons that we've got this terrific partnership with, with Nick. Uh, without it, political resolve to reduce emissions and to pursue energy and economic opportunities uh, is likely to wither. So this morning's presentation from McKinsey talked about the techno-economic uh, viable pathways to, to net zero. What about socially viable pathways? Is it possible? to build consensus or are there limits to consensus building? How much do information and facts change minds? What consensus building processes has Canada attempted? How well have they worked? How well have they not worked? And what more uh, needs to be done? These are not easy questions. We've put them to our panelists. We're looking forward to their thoughts today. We're gonna begin with a presentation from Dr. Marissa Beck, Positive Energy's Research Director, who has conducted some really tremendous research in this space. And then we're gonna ask JP and Ed to uh, come up on stage after her presentation and we'll have a discussion. So Marissa, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Monica. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. So uh, as Monica said, while Nick just now spoke about public opinion, I will turn to the opinions of decision makers in Canada's energy community. So I will be speaking about a research study called What is Transition that I worked on with my co-author Amy Richard back in 2019. And the study has been mentioned multiple times uh, this morning already. So um, I'm looking forward to shedding a bit of light uh, uh, on what, what we were actually doing back then. So as the title suggests in this project, we were interested in examining how leaders in the uh, energy and environment community in Canada understand and use the term transition. Um, energy transition, low carbon transition, clean energy transition, transition uh, that term was everywhere at the time. And we were wondering if decision makers actually mean the same thing when they, when they say transition. So in the spring of 2019, we interviewed more than 40 decision makers from Canada's energy and environment community. We tried to be really representative across sectors and regions. And uh, what we found was that there are some fundamental things uh, that everyone agreed on. Uh, climate change is real. Canada will be impacted uh, by climate change and Canada should and already is already uh, taking some action in some form or fashion uh, to address climate change. But that was pretty much where the agreement ended. Um, so looking at the differences now in people's understandings, decision makers understandings of the terminology of transition, we identified two central contrasting narratives about Canada's energy future in an age of climate change, and specifically the scale and scope of the change that will be needed. So according to the first narrative, Canada's transition should be a gradual, measured, mostly market-driven process. Uh, that narrative included a lot of concerns about the economic costs of transitioning Canada's energy system to lower emissions. And importantly, in this narrative also, Canada's oil and gas sector uh, will have an important role to play both in the transition, uh, but also beyond into the foreseeable future. So this narrative emphasized uh, the emissions reductions that the Canadian fossil fuel sector 
has already achieved and can achieve going forward. And also the argument that Canadian fossil fuels uh, can help um, replace higher emissions uh, energy sources elsewhere. And it is uh, the argument that it is so um, socially and environmentally responsibly produced uh, that exporting Canadian fossil fuels has the positive impact on the global energy market and global emissions. So that was narrative one. According to the second narrative, uh, Canada needs to transform its energy system urgently, quickly. It needs to be driven by ambition, ambitious policies and the scope and scale of the transition needs to be determined by what science tells us. What do we need to do to get to 1.5, two degrees uh, of increase in global average temperatures maximum? So importantly in this narrative, there is very little room for Canada's oil and gas sector in the medium to long-term going forward in that, in that scenario. So interestingly, we found that these two narratives seemed so deep and so deep-seated that we actually speak of them as different realities, reality one and reality two. So this choice of words was inspired by multiple interviewees uh, saying things along the lines of, we need to talk honestly about the reality of energy in Canada. But of course, they were talking, they were referring to different realities that they wanted to discuss honestly with each other. So in this project, we did not go much deeper into the question of how to overcome these deep divisions. Uh, but we looked at that question in two other positive energy studies that I would just want to quickly mention here. First, there was a case study of Canada's Ecofiscal Commission that was published just earlier this year. And that study showed that confronting people with information and even high quality evidence alone uh, is unlikely to bridge uh, these different realities and to overcome the politics that have become a attached to these different realities. The other study that I wanted to mention is uh, titled Overcoming Limits to Consensus Building on Energy and Climate. Uh, that was authored by my former colleague, Brendan Frank, who is actually here and who will um, present that study in a later session today. But that study suggested that nonpartisan or cross-partisan approaches to decision-making and dialogues are two promising avenues uh, for achieving more agreement. And I mentioned before the need for open, honest, inclusive conversations um, in Canada was also frequently mentioned uh, by the interviewees uh, for the transition study as a necessary step for Canada to improve consensus around climate and energy policy. Now, this data that I just presented is three years old, and I'm really excited to explore today in our conversation uh, whether the idea of two realities uh, still applies, or maybe, as Nick mentioned, we had now dealing with reality three and four, and uh, how we might work to overcome uh, these divisions and, and discuss a little bit the experiences that we've had over the past few years with these difficult, honest conversations and where that engagement has led us. Um, so to that end, I'm happy to ask my co-panelists, uh, J.P. Gledoux and Ed Whittingham on stage with me. Thank you. I wanted to just thank uh, Ed and JP for agreeing to serve on this panel. I think both of you are going to be bringing some really um, valuable insights and uh, perspectives uh, to uh, to our discussion today from the, the kind of real worlds, as it were, uh, the real realities of, of energy transition and Canada's energy and climate uh, uh, conversations, debates, and uh, activities. So maybe without further ado, Ed, we'll give you an opportunity to just share a few insights with us, move to JP, and then get into a discussion. And Nick, you'll be back in the in the fray. Sure. Great. Thanks, Monica. Thanks, Marissa. Uh, they've asked me, invited me here today, thank you, to speak about my experience of trying to bridge differences between diverse camps to get to climate and energy policies that work. Um, certainly a little more pessimistic going forward of our ability to do that collectively based on everything I'm hearing. But let me tell you some stories of things that have worked. But uh, I, I've done that because I've been called in the past uh, and currently I'm a, apparently a rational and pragmatic environmentalist. 
Um, now, I've got a mixed relationship with both of those adjectives because uh, they lacked a certain je ne sais quoi. You know, if I asked you, how's your marriage, and you respond rational and pragmatic, it doesn't exactly denote steamy romance. But it is what it is. And what does it mean? What it means for me is being a rational and pragmatic environmentalist it means on a good day, I'm being sniped at equally by the right and the left. And I've got the scars and stories to show for it. And I'll get to the latter in just a second. And as long as the sniping is roughly equal and volley, I kind of figure, hey, maybe I'm in the right spot. And, and what is that right spot? It's solidly the unsexy, mucky middle, where I think typically the majority of Canadians lie. And, um, you know, after all, how did the Canadian, uh, why did the Canadian cross the road to get to the middle? So what we're trying to do, and we're trying to chart this middle path on energy and climate. So uh, one story about trying to bridge the divide in the past, um, this happened back in 2015, when it was, I think then it was kind of unfathomable that the province of Alberta would be getting international recognition for something that had done on climate. And all that had changed. Within six months uh, after the election of a new government, the province went from being like an international whipping boy on climate to arguably taking the single biggest step taken by any jurisdiction anywhere forward on, on climate and energy with a new climate plan. And what was noteworthy, if um, you can think back to the day in November 2015, when we had the announcement, was the diverse support that we had from oil and gas players, the environmental community, and First Nations. And I'm looking at John Mitchell, because he was a part, just to recognize, he was a, a deep part. And sorry if I'm looking around, I haven't checked the audience, but John, John's got all the same scars and stories that I have to tell. So think of the stage, if you got the CEOs of four major energy companies, including Murray Edwards, you've got Chief Tony Alexis of the Alexis Nakota Sioux First Nation, and then you've got five environmental NGO leaders, including Stephen Gilbo, who has since gone on to a different profession related, all on stage holding hands and uh, in support of the climate plan. And that at the time was really hard to imagine because it's kind of faded from memory, but given the level of conflict that we'd had over particularly Alberta's oil sands in the many years, and in fact, decade or decade and a half prior to that. But that support enabled the government of the day to be more ambitious than it would have otherwise. Now, getting to that point of holding hands in consensus on stage, it, it wasn't easy. Um, it came about because the members of our group realized that, frankly, no one was getting anywhere. You know, we weren't getting at the problem. GHGs kept rising. Uh, the environmentalists felt we weren't getting good climate policy, federally, provincially, and, and the problem of climate was becoming all the more real every day. And the companies themselves, they're trying lots of things and coming up with climate plans, sort of throwing emissions reduction spaghetti at the wall as they should do with R&D, seeing what sticked, stuck. But they weren't getting any credit for what they were doing, including driving down GHGs on a, on a per barrel basis. So no one was winning, we thought we were stuck. So a group of us decided to step out in a group of executives and environmental leaders and uh, we thought, we said, okay, well, let's take a pause in the shoving match just long, of a, long enough for us to have a dinner and see if we can actually find any common agreement. And in the dinner, you know, we sort of talked about family. We talked about sports. Heck, one of the owners of the Calgary Flames is there. I hit him up for free Flames tickets. Didn't work. Um, but we got through and we realized, okay, what we have in common is that we all want a strong and prosperous Canada including the environmental leaders in the room. And we all want meaningful progress on climate change. And, and that included the industry leaders in the room. And we thought, well, that should be enough of a seed for us to keep on talking. So we did. And we continued that for the best part of a year. When our consensus building work, by the way, became public, we were all crucified. We we're all branded as traitors, essentially by our own communities. We got together after the fact, compared scars, Say, so oh, you, they called you a traitor? Well, they called me a traitor, you know? But from those humble origins of one dis, uh, dinner together to multiple conversations, heavy lifting from the likes of John Mitchell and his colleagues, from my colleagues at the Pemmon Institute, we actually got to agreement and consensus that in the end had um, a great impact on that climate plan of the day. 
And oh, by the way, that climate plan, the provincial plan, had an impact after that on the federal climate plan that came out later. So some of what we talked about and agreed to is still in federal law today. Not all of it survived, but a lot of it is there. So it was worth it. I've made since a profession of trying to, trying to bring together diverse interests to try to find common cause, common understanding on our toughest climate energy challenges of the day. Um, policymakers love it when you're able to do it because it creates safe space. They're like, oh, the suits, i.e. the executives, and the roots, the environmentalists, indigenous communities, uh, labor groups, they agree on something? Well, that's safe, and that helps me, given Nick's polling data, to think, okay, well, this is a winning policy. So they love it. I love it because, well, it's fun to do, and uh, it helps us to break energy gridlock and move Canada forward. But I can tell you, in the last few years, it doesn't feel so safe anymore. The middle has become decidedly unsafe with this, you're either with us or against us mentality, part of which is fueled by our Harper partisan social media world right now. And I've recently been flayed by both the left and the right. You know, I came out, I'm a card carrying environmentalist. I came out in support of the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which ended up being a very effective way of alienating friends and colleagues in the environmental movement. Um, and I got about as much upside, I thought, for taking a principled decision as the federal government did in backing the Trans Mountain uh, Pipeline. And the answer is no upside, zero upside to, to doing that, as far as I can tell. And then I became, call it public enemy number one in Alberta for a short period of time uh, and became the subject of a, a highly publicized far Ed Whittingham from the board of the Alberta Energy Regulator campaign. And I'm immortalized on page 97 of the United Conservative Party's uh, uh, 19, uh, 2019 election platform, right there, Fire Ed Whittingham. Today, I say ironically, I shared something in common with Premier Kenny, and that for a time, we were both the most hated man in Alberta, and we both decided to resign before we could get fired. So what I'm, uh, let me pass the floor to, to JP, but I'd say arguably these days, and the polling data supports it, it's harder to build consensus, it's difficult, it gets personal. You attract the cranks and crazies. I hate to say it, if you're stepping up publicly at all, the challenge is we can't stop trying to do so. And we need it in order to break climate and energy gridlock and I think move the country forward. So I'll leave it at that and look forward to uh, the discussion. <laughs> I need a hug just as much as Ed. Um, I block two worlds. I'm First Nation. I live in my community in Northern Ontario. I work in the business community and then I work in my Indigenous community. And of course, Canadians think we're all anti development, of course. And that is farthest, farthest thing from the truth. Sheldon, thank you so much for kind of laying a lot of the groundwork for me this morning. I wanted to talk about three things about caring, believing, and doing. I think, you know, since the Truth and Reconciliation Commission came out, uh, since the mass graves, the 215, and that number is growing, came out, I think Canadians have woken up and they actually care. I've been at this for 30 years in, for in my profession, and then that's cross-secting with the natural resource sector, and it's it's it feels liberating to finally be heard on a regular basis and to be constantly invited to share perspectives. But back to the two worlds, um, I often am in the same role. Um, and I didn't know, John, that you were such a sucker for punishment because I also chair this group called the Boreal Leadership Champions, which is oil, gas, mining, forestry, finance, tourism, indigenous leadership. And again, we're trying to find that middle space, as good Canadians as we are, um, and trying to find solutions that go forward. But I want to tell you just about the caring, the believing, and the doing. And what you think about indigenous communities, if you haven't been in my space or some of our allies' space, um, I think what I'm going to tell you might surprise you a little bit. Um, so I, again, I think we all care. It's the believing part that we've got it. We're still struggling with. I think Canadians don't believe that we're well. Like I just said, pro development. We're not anti development. We're anti the way things used to be done, where industry came to our back door, ripped up our ground, extracted all of our resources, left a total mess behind, and we got maybe one or two jobs. And so we're like, yeah, of course we're anti that. Anybody would be anti that noise. We're very much pro-resource development. 
How many of you think if I said 20% of us are really supportive of resource development? Do you think it's higher? Maybe 30%, 40%? Nick and I were chatting and Nick was pretty close. He said, I think it's about 60%. I said, Nick, you're pretty damn close. Were you reading my notes over my shoulder? It's actually 65%. 65% of indigenous people strongly support or support resource development. Again, when it's done correctly, about 22% against, and there's a little bit in the middle. I think that's pretty conducive to any culture. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, but yet again, I was talking to my friend, is he still here, Jeff? Oh, he's, he left the room. Um, he says, well, part of the challenge is that the media portrays all of you Indigenous people, and they don't want to talk about the good news stories um, to actually have an informed conversation in this country, because the believing part, I'm going to tell you stories now that I hope you start to believe me when I say our country, it can be in a really great place. I'm actually more optimistic than the average Canadian, probably more optimistic than the average Indigenous person as well when it comes to our future. When I think about some of the our history, you know, we had some jobs at the beginning. Now, procurement and supply chain, we have 60,000 Indigenous entrepreneurs. We were Canada's first entrepreneurs, and then you came to our territory and, and you borrowed a lot of our of our business practices. And quite frankly, it supplied originally the European markets with furs, et cetera, and medicines. But we've got incredible entrepreneurs um, providing, you know, again, I sit on the Suncor board and in our supply chain, over $950 million a year spent on Indigenous entrepreneurs. There's been billions of dollars spent on Indigenous businesses and entrepreneurs. I used to chair the Mikasu Group of Companies, which is doing close to a billion dollars a year in revenue, either through wholly owned companies or joint ventures. Most people in this room are going, billions of dollars? Yes, billions of dollars. And now we look at the transition of our Indigenous entrepreneurs and our community businesses. Now we're owning companies. We're owning infrastructure. For instance, the Clearwater deal. You know, Isn't it ironic that we had all this racist activity towards my people, my cousins in the East Coast, they were burning down our fishing boats, et cetera. <laughs> Guess what happened now? We bought half the company that they have to sell to. We own, the Mi'kmaq own 50% of the Clearwater deal. They are the, 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 the producers of what kind of Canada's largest seafood companies. We've got a company in Saskatchewan, Metal Lake Travel Council, doing $100 million a year in revenue producing Canada's forest products. Pipelines are being co-owned by Indigenous entrepreneurs and businesses and communities. So this is just the way that we're going to, if, if Chris Anderson was in the room today, he'd say, I, I can't remember his stat, but I'm, I know I'm being... Hmm? Oh, Chris is online. Awesome. So Chris, you can send me a note if I got this wrong. But you know, he, he's author of Aboriginal Power, an amazing ally of the Indigenous community. Catalyst 2020. I think it's 86% or 85. Anyways, north of 80% of new energy projects that are coming online are owned or co-owned by Indigenous people and communities. So why is this so important? It's important and we talk about all this regulatory and we talk about the uncertainty. It's important because it's about shared certainty. If we're at the table as partners, if we're at the table as equity investors, if we're at the table benefiting, if we're at the table making sure that product projects get developed from inception to operations to decommissioning, and we're at the table with our knowledge holders, which by the way is tens of thousands or 10,000 plus years old in many cases, we're going to make sure it gets done and we're going to benefit and we're going to support you. We're going to be your biggest house. I think the regulatory process should go like this. Project inception, indigenous inclusion, and then we'll do everything else. The toughest thing in this whole process is making sure that we have indigenous people agreeing to your products. If you don't, in any linear project, like Goldie Hyder said this morning, we can't get anything built. Is because if you're not going to include us, we're going to say no. That is just the way it goes now, Canada. That's been the paradigm shift. So there's lots of lessons to be had. So there's lots of things now the do part. We'll get into some conversations about more of what we can do, but we've got to create more equity capital pools. The Aboriginal, uh, sorry, the Alberta Indigenous Opportunities Corporation has got a billion dollar fund. I know Saskatchewan's jumped into the fray. We've got the Canadian Infrastructure Bank's got a billion dollar fund to support our equity participation in projects. Indigenous people and board of directors. I mean, it goes on and on. Um, I can go on and on, so I will stop there. I hope I inspired you to care a little bit more, to believe that we can do the things that I'm suggesting that we're already doing, we can do more, and really it's about doing now. Thank you.
Thanks, JP. I think maybe we'll all line up for hugs mm -hmm. for the panel. <laughs> <laughs> um, interesting, I thought, juxtaposition, your remarks uh, compared to, to Ed, Ed's remarks and, you know, goes to Marissa's question around the study that we conducted around the two realities and division within the expert kind of energy and environmental communities is it have things gotten better have things gotten worse i'd like to just kind of peel that onion a little bit uh and also you know hear from from nick on this as well but maybe i'll start with you ed in your remarks you talked about sort of hyper partisan uh social media like what are some of the things that you see that have changed because on the one hand it's like okay we have more alignment around net zero We've got more. I mean, we just heard that great talk from from Susanna Pierce. So you kind of could look at it on paper and say, well, now we probably should. It should be easier to do these things. And yet, I'm hearing you say the opposite. So would love to just have you unpack that a little bit for us. Yeah, and at the risk of, you know, back in the day when kids did bad things, you'd point to video games, you'd point to TV. Yeah. Now we point to social media. I will say, social media definitely is an aggravator or as a catalyst, it's kind of like the analogy where it's just turning up gravity. And when you turn up gravity, things like this building starts to sway or planes fall out of the air or buses can't run. So that's one thing that's definitely changed in my career and that now whatever you think, whatever you want to believe, you can certainly find it. And I'm not telling anyone anything startling new here, startlingly new. What I've found is where I think we used to have um, that rational, pragmatic conversation if it at all touches, frankly, oil and gas on climate, as it must, as it represents 25% of uh, Canada's emissions, a huge percentage of our GDP and our exports, then people become, frankly, um, some of them become crazed. Mm. And on both sides, it's, well, you know, this is my livelihood, my job, and I say this, and I, I live in Alberta, and I get it, and um, you know, you've got people career people who have been unemployed now for going on a half decade or more and they really feel that gee this wasn't the social compact i had that the social compact was I, I would train and then i would get a lifetime job and i'd provide for myself and my family and that isn't the case anymore and then i find with some of the the, the colleagues friends and colleagues that i have in the environmental movements now there's such a high level of distrust and they might be trusted in quebec environmental groups they're not trusted in alberta i saw was, was the lowest bar yeah. kind of live that that now if there's something like the ccus investment tax credit which i've worked very closely on you know the rough consensus among some in the environmental community is oh we love it but it just shouldn't apply to oil and gas and not that it's you know i'm not against the emissions i'm actually against the industry itself which is the subtext and, and I don't know how to get around it, given that it's such a large proportion of our economy and such a large proportion of our emissions. So I think it's bringing out some of that irrationality right now that folks like us who try to bridge, we're just getting faced with every day. Hmm, interesting. Nick, I'd, I'd like to kind of turn to you because I know you've done some work uh, for a variety of clients around social media and the kind of the role of social media. Any Any thoughts on that in terms of you know, you started out with us in 2015. What's 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 changed on that front that might also be affecting uh, capacity for consensus building? You know, it's it interesting. The uh, one of the most interesting things that we learned, and I guess it makes sense in, in retrospect, but you know, we we started to measure what would be the markers of someone being susceptible to misinformation or disinformation, and the top marker was posting on social media every day that if you didn't post on social media every day, you were probably more resilient to misinformation and disinformation. But you know, to your point, uh, the center has been abandoned. And I think people feel that they have been abandoned. And uh, I think one of the other challenges is that we have governments now that are spending more time listening to social media than listening to Canadians and they're making decisions. They think that is the world. And uh, I, I think we need to kind of uh, rebase things because that's kind of like the, the sensational confrontation that we see in the media, because uh, you know, to the point that was made earlier, media organizations, and I work for some media organizations, are interested in conflict. Hmm. Conflict has eyeballs, but it doesn't capture what most people are, are feeling on things. Hmm. And how do we kind of get get around that then? Is it creating more spaces like this? Is it what's what's your sense, Nick? Of well, it starts uh, it starts with our elected officials 
starting to speak for the silent majority mm. and not pandering to the fringes. You know, the, one of the things that we've seen in democracies around the world is that it's been more effective to have a base in a particular part of the spectrum and then try to build from the base mm. as opposed to building from the center, mm. uh, uh, which is where, uh, you know, we, we do the polarization and yeah, it's, yeah. it's still a normal distribution curve. And the other thing, there's still a significant proportion of Canadians that refuse to put themselves on an ideological spectrum, which means that, you know, that normal distribution is even more dramatic. Yeah, for sure. JP, I mean, one of the things that that I've certainly observed over the course of the last few years is just, it's it's all the stuff that you said, basically, and, and the, you know, the emergence of, of organizations, whether it's Sheldon's or the First Nations Major Projects Coalition, all the great work that uh, the CCAB and, and others have done. Um, so, you know, things have really moved in a, in a very positive direction. There is, is there something there that we could, you know, harness for lack of a better word? Are there things that, that, that we should be thinking about uh, that could potentially be uh, helpful to forge a consensus more broad based in Canada on these issues? That's a great question. Well, the, the challenge with, with it is, you know, even though I painted a relatively progressive, rosy or future yeah. and lots of the great things, the, the challenge is that we're not a monolith. We all don't think the same thing. And, and to Nick's point, as well as Ed's point, is what the media portrays, um, it's very difficult to combat that. I think having, you know, real conversations with influencers in these types of rooms to educate each other, that's a big part of it. One of the things that really upsets me, um, you know, when I see, you know, one of the things I actually was talking to Ed this morning, and then I said, Ed, it was about six years ago, I said, you said something that resonated so much with me that I, that I reference it quite often. Uh, he was on the stage with Michael Crothers, the previous country chair before uh, Susanna with Shell, and he said, you know, environmentalists, they get up in the morning, the first thing that they're that, that, that's on their on the mind is not like how do we destroy the economy and you know oil and gas producers the first thing on their mind is not how are we going to destroy the environment so but but we got to be careful about what we communicate out there and who we listen to so one of the things that was really starting to upset me um is that we've got this unrealistic expectation that can, indigenous people have to have 100 percent consensus mm -hmm. like look at the what's all issue there's 20 first nations one of the line one community had um, a one part of their hereditary chiefs who said no, a split vote 50 50. Um, there was actually more support still for the line, but the whole country erupted. And that was the perception. And we had major disruptions, even with their own communities. And, and, and you know, it wasn't great. Another thing, you know, when I see these, these protesters, and they're called eco colonialists down in Toronto, um, you know, saying free prior informed consent and their own white people. Who's never been to one of our communities and i and my response to them is like who the hell gave you free prior and conform cons, informed consent to speak for us to say no for us to get access to capital so we can do you know that's often the only place for many of our communities in this country for from prosperity and not having to live who wants to live on handouts the rest of their lives is natural resource development so it's the misperception misconception just the gross um um white water or the, the just the, the the stroke of the pen that we're all the same so we got to beat that and then we can start to addressing a lot of the other things that i was talking about but let's find our allies indigenous and not and i can speak a, a nauseam with lots of great non-indigenous canadians that are standing side by side with us to make a better future great marissa any thoughts from you i mean you've thought long and hard about this uh, leading that study yeah that's true uh, i guess this study and then the studies that followed um as well, we definitely focus a lot around polarization and consensus building and how they uh, work work together over the past three years at Positive Energy. Just a couple of thoughts. And the first one is maybe, just as Ed has said, it's nothing new, but I think it's just a lot easier and faster to destroy trust and to create polarization and conflict than to mend it and heal it afterwards. So I think it's not surprising that the process of actually creating new agreement or fostering consensus is so much harder than uh, creating divisions in the first place. So maybe we just need to be a bit patient. And then the other thought that I was thinking about, um, the other idea was how kind of our ideas and our thinking and the political discourse always evolves in linked with the actual policy developments or changes in our institutions or changes in how we do business. So JP was mentioning, uh, well, there's a lot of support among Indigenous communities, but also that's partly because 
we're doing things differently now and there are ownership agreements and there are two partnerships. So those two go hand in hand. And I was thinking about the uh, case study of the Eco Fiscal Commission that I authored earlier this year where we were looking at uh, support for carbon pricing in Canada and kind of how the discourse evolved and the influence that the Eco Fiscal Commission had on policy development and the political discourse. And one, one uh, paragraph in our conclusion was basically, well, a lot has happened. We had a Supreme Court a ruling on the constitutionality of the carbon price. We actually have carbon pricing now. We had, at least last year, a conservative um, party platform that included provisions for carbon pricing. So it is evolving. Certain facts are created, certain uh, political norms, policies are created that over time, slowly, I think, will be in dialogue and will feed back into, into discourse. It's going to be a, a back and forth of uh, talking about new realities, creating new realities, uh, mm -hmm. and, and slowly moving forward. Well, and there's an interrelationship between all of these things as well, because Ed, as you were referring to, uh, you know, the, the work that you did in in Alberta, um, one of the other studies that was authored by uh, Dwayne Bratt around energy federalism spoke uh, quite a good deal about that process. And it was really hard to find that picture, by the way, of all of you folks on the stage. Anyway, <laughs> we, <thank you. laughs> we found it. <laughs> <laughs> we found it. We got the rates and everything that, you know, licensing and whatnot. Anyway, so it made me think about about that. And, you know, to Marissa's point that that that, you know, there really aren't any silver bullets. Hmm. But individual initiatives, so important like that, that then paved the way for the, the Pan-Canadian framework on clean, clean growth and climate change, that then paved the way for and create sort of a different, uh, you know, a different uh, um, reality as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, uh, as things move forward. Um, I, I want to come to this concept of consensus. So we talked a lot about this at Positive Energy and JP, you just picked up on it as well. Um, when we first were framing up our research and engagement program a few years back, we used the word consensus, and we had a few folks kind of, I don't know if push back on that is the right word, but at least they, they questioned it. They said, well, it's not necessarily about finding consensus for all the reasons you've just raised, but it's about sort of consensus building. And that's why we went with the, the framing of consensus building. So, you know, Canada does tend to be a consensus seeking country to the, you know, joke that you said at the outset of, uh, of your remarks. You know, it, is it possible to build consensus? around net zero is consensus building the right way to frame this or are there different ways that we need to be thinking uh, about this i'm going to turn to you first nick because you and i have had a few conversations yeah. on exactly this topic and you i know you've got some thoughts yeah i uh you know i think uh i always think of it in terms of acceptance not necessarily consensus can you get to a point where everyone can accept they might not be enthusiastic they might not love it 100 percent, but that they can accept it because it's in it's it's for the public good. It's for everyone's good. So, uh, I think uh, you know, especially with this environment that we're in, this turbocharged environment of polarization and sensational opinions, that consensus is uh, not attainable. But ex acceptance is, and you know, and, and also, I think I think there's uh, more room for Indigenous peoples to lead more on this mm -hmm. file and to help Canadians figure out a solution mm -hmm. to this beyond just ownership participation, because I think it's, uh, you know, the, uh, for a lot of the, for in the non-Indigenous space, the thoughts tend to be very transactional. What do we need to do? Give me five things that I need to do. Mm -hmm. I'll do them tomorrow and we can get it done. And I don't think that, I don't think that that's not working. Mm -hmm. It's just not working now. Uh, so, uh, so I think in terms of acceptance and what are the conditions for acceptance, and uh, and to uh, try to identify those in order to move forward. Can I jump in there? I, I thank you for saying that. I think um, I, I also agree with the consensus is it's just unattainable. Um, it's, it is really about acceptance. There's two things to it. It's about being informed. So when we talk about indigenous issues in this country, we talk about free, prior, and informed mm -hmm. consent. Informed, it's process that is so mm -hmm. absolutely important. I just learned last night, Nick, that. Um, I, Val, if you don't know Valerie Courtois, you need to know this woman. She's an Inuit, or she's an in, Inu. Um, I've known her since 2000. She's a fellow forester. She's incredible. She runs the Guardians program, and you know she's t telling me last night because the, the the Arctic states, all the different countries, and Russia, they they can't decide on stuff. They actually are putting the Inuit in care and control of process because their culture 
circum circumnavigates that all that area and who better to do it who's been on the land for thousands of years right um and so really when i get back to the informed in informed also requires a lot of capacity and capacity requires dollars and education um we'll have a better chance at at acceptance because we'll, i don't think we'll ever get to consensus if we do a better job in the informed portion of the work go ahead Sure. I will agree. Yes, I think consensus <laughs> is uh, impossible. And by one statistic, you have a, a non-trivial number of Americans and Canadians who think that the planes that we have crisscrossing the sky every day, every day, that the contrails coming out behind them are laced with chemicals to either cause climate change, to reverse climate change, or to rot our kids' brains. Mm -hmm a non-trivial measurable number who really think that that's happening. And once you have that in society, for Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum, this cabal of cap capitalists are actually socialists and they want to install a, a, a global socialist order, then it's impossible because frankly, people, um, they've just lost the plot. But what you can, I think we could get to in Canada, say is a commonly held vision of what Canada's energy future looks like. And the problem is we get to the platitudes around that. And I've been, I've been part of 14 different energy climate conversations in my career. And I'd call them the latest Neville Chamberlain like peace for our time conversations where it was the only one, the one with John and, and others that, that really stuck. You get to this level of agreement on the platitudes, but then as soon as you start talking numbers and attach a number to it, it's like, whoa, 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 you know, that's difficult. In the same way, I think our politicians, going back to your point, Nick, I mean, we should hold them accountable for being guilty of happy talk. And happy talk <laughs> is, we'll get to our 2030 target, and we're going to maintain jobs, and we'll have full Indigenous participation in the economy, and all these things that are great sound bites, and that we want, but we're not having an honest conversation about the trade-offs. We're just not. And as the Globe and Mail reported yesterday in its expose, take the oil and gas sector alone, it doesn't violate the laws of physics for the oil and gas sector to get to that 2030 target. It comes pretty damn close. And maybe we don't want that because maybe the social upheaval and the denial of, of uh, the ability to participate in the economic upside, say for indigenous communities, is just too great a trade-off to strive for that. But we're not having an honest conversation. We stay at the happy talk level. And I think we, we need to start pushing back on the happy talk a bit more. Mm. Marissa, any thoughts on this? And then I'll open it up to the audience for questions. Yeah, maybe the only thing, the, the happy talk, but then also the, well, unhappy doesn't really work, but the blaming talk, you know, like that, it's that's wrong, that's bad. So I think on the one hand, it's yes, we have these targets and we can do it, no problem, but that is wrong. You're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong. So I think it's the flip side of that when that's become uh, politicized and there's uh, there's a, a blame game or a, a, a very strict right or wrong way that is, as you mentioned, kind of ignoring, neglecting the nuances and the, the space between the black and white. Questions from uh, from the audience? Can I grab the bike first? <laughs> <laughs> Did you just bring one with you, John? You <laughs> Always be prepared and uh, long history of that. <laughs> Um, John Mitchell with Suncor, for those I don't know. Um, thanks, just fabulous remarks from all of you. I really appreciate um, all the insights that you've shared. One of the things that I, I heard is a bit of a common thread through all of the different conversations. I mean, Nick, you've been studying it for a long time. Ed, you alluded to it. JP, you talked about it. And it's been in a lot of the research that Positive Energy has done. But that's the role that trust plays. And, you know, Nick, you've been, you talked about trust. Um, Ed, I remember in the conversations we were having, if, if there wasn't trust, you couldn't stand up and say, I'm triggered by that. Mm -hmm. That That's setting me off and, and it would open up a whole different dialogue. At JP and the Boreal conversations that we've been having, it's a lot about trust. It's a lot about how do we build these bonds and how do we use relationships to, to enhance that? How do you see the role of trust and the role of relationships in kind of unpacking and tackling some of these challenges of of polarization, how do, how do we get there and how do we foster it? I think we have to start with what Ed said. The happy talk undermines trust. Mm -hmm. It undermines trust in everything because 
you're, you're hearing things and people know that it's not true. It's, you know, like you might call it happy talk. Other people might call it a lie hmm. that there are people saying a lie. And you know what, what's the difference between a lie and a mistruth? If they say something that they know cannot be achieved. And, you know, I, and, and I think this is, this starts with, at least from my perspective and the research that we've done, it just starts with telling the truth. And you know what, can I tell you something? If you tell people the truth and you tell them the objective, they're actually, most people are willing to make the sacrifices for the future. You just have to tell them, this is a sacrifice that we're, you're gonna have to make. Next, future generations will benefit from the sacrifice and this is how it's going to work. And, and I would hazard to say there are probably enough people that if they're told the truth, they're told the destination and they're explained the sacrifice that needs to be made. Now, what that sacrifice is, is a different, is, is a whole other kind of kettle of fish. But I think that's actually the first step is having an, having an honest conversation so that people, and, and this speaks to, you know, being informed. Like we can't have elected officials misinforming people, which is what we're having right now. Please don't tweet that. So, <laughs> yeah, maybe if I can build upon that, yes, and it starts with having an honest conversation about trade offs and say, if we want to get to our climate targets, there are probably people will lose jobs. And, or, but if we value it and we have a normal conversation, we say, well, we're a small emitter and we won't get those targets, we're going to keep those jobs, you know, and it's probably one of the, the other, and at least start having that conversation and let people weigh in and honestly say what's most important to them. In the absence of that, then there is the distrust and you can't get to that point like where we got to or others where you can say, okay, I understand really what the downsides are, but like you say, you know, I'm, I'm willing to accept that one way or the other. Uh, look at the case of the US Clean Air Act when it was introduced. Um, it wasn't framed this way up front, but the, after the passing of the US Clean Air Act, it had a measurable impact on US GDP, a measurable negative impact. Economists could go in and could measure it. It cost a point or two of GDP. But the upside of that was fewer people died of respiratory illness. And they say, okay, well, that's just the honest, people lose jobs, but you know, we're gonna have people you know, not die of respiratory illness. So it's gotta be kind of one of those open conversations. Now, how you do it in a way across, not just a municipality or a province or a country, I'm not, I'm not smart enough to figure that out. But I just think in the absence of that, then um, yeah, we won't build the trust. And it's that trust that allows us to break gridlock. And right now I'd say Canada for a large part, we're an energy gridlock. So fundamental to this country's healing with the Indigenous community is the truth and reconciliation, right? The truth is finally known. Um, now the reconciliation part is the heart. That's the hard, the hard, the, the hard truth is difficult and still very difficult. The reconciliation piece is, is if you haven't read the 94 calls to action, just read the headlines, see what resonates you and, and do incremental change. Just, and, and come, to, like if you, make sure you have a, high say do ratio. If you're going to say something, then do it. Don't say something and not do it. That's a great way again to just to break the trust that you're trying to build through the truth. So um, there's another awesome, outstanding individual indigenous <laughs> guy with that, Jess. So. Maris, any thoughts from you? Uh, maybe just super quick. Uh, I think in all the studies, I'm working on a different study right now about equity, diversity, inclusion, and energy decision making in Canada. and the transition study that I worked on, the e Francisco study, I think one common theme across all is that humans don't necessarily like change and big change is scary. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, embarking on that change in, in partnership, in relationship, in, in an atmosphere of trust is just easier. It makes it easier for people to take a step into something that is uncertain. Um, so yeah, I think it's a, a, a general common theme that I can see across many uh, positive energy studies. Change is hard. Sheldon. Um, good afternoon and good good speaking. Um, I want to just really echo um, quick, I think, some of some of JP's points, because I think it's important that many of you understand, you know, the perspectives that, that we come from, that we aren't adverse to development. 
um, as long as it's done right. And I think it's, it's extremely important that government and industry understand Indigenous people or First Nations ties to the land. Not just we walk upon it and live upon it, but we belong to it. We belong to these lands. And when we're asked to participate or be informed or develop a project, many of our people have been uh, passed down culturally or traditionally responsibilities that tie directly and spiritually to our lands, waters, and animals and medicines. And, and those people are an important part of the conversations as it relates to uranium, oil and gas, whatever the case may be. So it's a constant tightrope balance of traditions, culture, environment, ensuring that can continue for generations coming forward, jobs, contracts, equity, and economic development. So when you meet with a chief, when you meet with a council, when you meet with elders, they're wrestling with, with that balance in every decision that they make. Similar to a concept of karma, we have a teaching in our Cree ways called Pastahuin. And the creator has a whip and certain people are designated to carry those whips to remind ceremonial people and leadership that these responsibilities are still here today. And people will get corrected. And leadership as they engage in resource development have to be mindful and they are mindful of what that means. So just leading into your comment around sacrifice, then they have to think about, can I sacrifice this for this? And, you know, as I mentioned earlier, and JP mentioned, like the informed, making sure that there's proper capacity, that people right to the elders, to the land users understand what this project means, how it may impact them down the line, then they can wrestle with it. But if we don't know, as JP mentioned, We've seen destruction all around us. We were at zero prior to contact in our eyes. Mm. And now we're looking to get back, get back there to make sure the environment, our medicines, our animals, we're able to utilize these natural resources that the creator gave us effectively and properly. So I, I, I wanted to mention that. And then I picked up on another piece of uh, JP's point around, you know, meeting with us as First Nations directly or Indigenous people. I want to I, I, I want to follow that because um, it's important that, yes, there's environmentalists, some, some extreme, but they don't speak for us as Indigenous people. That's very, very important. Um, I'll give a specific um, example. I have many, but when, when the Husky oil spill happened in 2016, it devastated our river system on the North Saskatchewan River in Saskatchewan. And so I was appointed to emergency command and, and led the emergency response for our nations. So we had 12 First Nations with, with lands along the shores of the North Saskatchewan River and impacts of oil all the way down, you know, 475 kilometers to James Smith, Cumberland House Delta. We spent two years on the river um, sampling um, sediment and water and not once did I see any of those people out there with us to, to work at protecting that waterway. It was me and, and my team and our First Nations people along the shores. So that's a very important example that I would be very offended if anybody attempted to speak on our behalf uh, as an environmentalist that wasn't there with us uh, every day along the river. We walk lots of shorelines. And uh, so I, I just wanted to mention that, and I, I want to say it as a, not, uh, you know, damning comments by any means, but more of an invite uh, to encourage you to, to reach out to us as Indigenous people. And if you don't know, there's people like GP, people like myself, Jesse is here from FNMPC. We've created these organizations as First Nations or Indigenous people to be just that, to be that interface, to help connect the dots, to help provide a pathway to help support the conversation. So I'll leave my comments there. I just wanted to end with that because it's uh, it's uh, important notes to, to make that we're thinking like that all across the country, not just in one region. So thank you.
That's terrific. Thank you uh, so much, Sheldon. Does anybody want to pick up or comment on uh, what we said? Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Richard. Thank, thank you. My name is Richard Carlson. I'm from Pollution Probe. Um, as another moderate environmentalist, I too bear the scars of not jumping on the various bang, bandwagons, like uh, going all full in on electrification or still offering to work with oil and gas, which seems to offend a lot of people. But one thing I'd see it as, you see all these groups arguing for their piece of the pie. You have the oil and gas people saying, we need more money for CCS. And you see the other people saying, well, we should not give oil and gas any money for CCS. And I was, one thing I was wondering is it comes down to what we were talking about in the morning where we don't have a plan in Canada. We don't have a vision of where we're gonna go. Does that cause the polarization? Because we don't know where it is and everyone's trying to grab their little piece of the pie to make sure they don't lose it. Is that the reason? Does that cause the polarization? Or alternatively, is polarization meaning we can't get a plan in Canada? So I'm not sure which one it is. Like, how, where does this stuff come? Where does this come from? Thank you. Save the uh, easy question for last, I think. <laughs> Richard, thanks. I am told that we need to cut on the questions, but I want to give the panelists an opportunity to to respond to that. It's a terrific question. Just to Richard's point, I, I I don't think we have a commonly shared vision of Canada's energy future. And Canada's energy future can be synonymous with Canada's economic future. And there was a time when we, we could, you know, talk about national energy strategy and in rooms, and we didn't have to worry about the ghost of Pierre Trudeau and coming out and haunting that room, the elder, Pierre Trudeau, the elder, because it was too close to the national energy program. And we got there. And that's actually, it was, I, I sat in a building in the Suncor, the old Sunlight building with Canada West Foundation, with Canadian Association Petroleum Producer Suncor and the Pemina Institute saying this is necessary. It's going to be really difficult. It's going to be necessary. It, it was hard to get there and we didn't succeed. And unfortunately, we could have that conversation in Calgary, Canada's energy capital. We couldn't. It was too early to have that conversation in Ottawa. The politicians ran screaming for the exits. And we still haven't. I think we still sit here and, and we're talking about it. We just don't have this commonly shared vision of Canada's energy future. We need a national commission. We need something. It's more than the pan-Canadian print, you know? Oh, yeah. or, or responsible, clean, uh, what is hey, he, healthy energy, healthy environment, healthy economy, healthy environment. It's, it's far more than that. But I still, right now, I don't see a cabinet minister championing it because it's really, really hard. Mm -hmm. Marissa, you look like you, the wheels are turning. Oh, yeah, maybe just at a smaller scale, just coming back to the transition study. Yes, I do think, at least at that example, we saw there wasn't a commonly accepted or kind of really definition of what transition means or how it should be understood. And I think that um, what we've gathered from our interviews, on the one hand, had the effect that everyone understood it the way they wanted to and and it created more conflict and more polarization because everyone tried to kind of own the concept on the other hand we've also heard from some interviews that said it is good that it's such an open term because at least theoretically it invites everyone to the table everyone can see what they want can take their share and and it can bring people together um i think generally in the, in the spirit of uh, informed consent and, and providing information and making trade-offs clear, I think it would be good to have a clear definition of transition and by analogy to have a clear plan that that can be discussed um, to just get everyone to the table with at least the same ideas in their heads. I, I have one quick story. I promise I'll keep it under a minute about caring, believing, and doing. So my First Nation, my daughter comes up often to come hunting and fishing with me. I know these are my hunting, they look like my regular hunting clothes today. Um, we go down to the lake that is fully protected. It's the largest lake in Ontario and is protected. I drink the water at a lake. I was just doing it last week, catching fish. Uh, then we go down the road and my community owns the sawmill that's producing wood for our homes and the mining sector in the region and we cross the Trans-Canada Highway. Then we cross the, cross the Trans-Canada Pipeline on, my, on our side-by-side -side where my grandfather helped build. Then we go to the lithium mine sites that are going to be pro providing the critical minerals that we have, our First Nations have agreements with. Then we go down another road and my uncle manages two of the hydro facilities that our community co-owns with two other First Nations and, and Group Axor. 
So it can be done. I live it every time I go home. There's that balance between conservation, responsible development, and us providing resources for clean energy and the world. So it can be done. Thank you. Last word to you, Nick. Well, you know, I, I went back to, you know, the very first presentation from McKinsey, hmm. and they talk about the path forward. And we have to agree on some fundamental principles. And maybe one of the maybe one of the first principles that we have to agree to is that the solution is a portfolio solution. That we cannot anticipate what we're going to need 20, 30 years ago. It's kind of like your it's like your retirement fund, right? You have you have a diversified retirement fund because you want to make sure that the money's there and you achieve your objectives for when it's there. And then perhaps just having that type of attitude that we will have a portfolio of energy solutions that move us forward is the first step to have a dialogue as opposed to saying, to your point, Marissa, I don't like you and I like you and, uh, and to build that as part of the process. Great. Thanks, Nick. Um, there are the remaining keynotes and uh, panels this afternoon are really going to be starting to dig into these issues a little bit more in terms of intergovernmental collaboration. How do we navigate you know, partisan polarization? This panel has done just a tremendous job, I think, of laying the groundwork for that and providing some really solution-focused ideas uh, in and of themselves. So I'd like to invite everybody to join me in thanking our panelists. Well done. Thank you.